Hello, I'm Dr. Cesar J. Bravo from Cleveland Clinic Orthopedics at Virginia Tech in Roanoke, Virginia, and I'll be discussing today the topic forearm fractures. Forearm fractures present in a varied way. They will present in the young patient population. Usually these are associated with high energy injuries. We may also see them in the geriatric or osteopenic patients uh, later in life, and these are usually considered low energy events. One thing to consider when we're treating forearm fractures is to consider the forearm as a joint composed of the disorinary joint, the unosseous membrane, and the proximal renal joint. When we look at these injuries of the forearm, uh, these fractures, also consider them being some form of articular injury. They tend to involve the disorinary joint, the proximal renal joint, interposed between with the radius and the ulna and the interosseous membrane in the middle. This is more con consideration as a knee uh, with each condyle at the end of the disorinary joint or the proximal radial joint interposed by that interosseous membrane, such as the, the knee with the ACL ligaments and where you have that ulna moving, uh, the radius moving along that fixed ulna. As we treat these injuries, important to note this is the relevant anatomy of the form uh, that needs to be applied and understood. It's looking first at the proximal radial joint, and this is where the articulation of the radial head with the proximal ulna takes place. We look at the disorinary joint, which is the articulation of the ulnar head with the radius and the interosseous membrane. The interosseous membrane is has multiple bands, which we'll mention later in the talk, but interposed in this interosseous membrane is the radius and the ulna. The radius tends to have a radial bow in the coronal plane, and in the proximal dorsal angulation in the sagittal plane, uh, it's noted uh, to the ulna to be aligned in this pattern. It's not, the ulna is not a straight bone and does have a distinct bow in the coronal plane, specifically in the proximal portion, which tends to have some various alignment. The radial bow is important for the forearm rotation as well as the interosseous membrane as it connects both bones uh, obliquely from proximal radius to distal ulna. As we see in, in the shearing of the forces from the wrist with translating proximally not only in a longitudinal plane but also in a transverse plane. And you have these interosseous membranes interposing from, from distal to proximal, proximal to distal. The axis of rotation of the form runs through the radio head proximally in the ulnar fovea distally, and it runs in an oblique line. And the distal radius effectively rotates around the distal ulna to provide pronation supination. The anatomy of the form in the coronal plane is consists by the radial bow, uh, which the radius is bowed from the radial tuberosus to metathesis. The ulna is convex towards the radius at the proximal ulnar joint, is slightly concave at the mid to distal third. The anatomy of the form in the sagittal plane, the radius is essentially straight. The ulna can be slightly concave away from the elbow, but gently convex at the mid to distal third. One thing to note, as Dr. Graham King and his group have delineated quite nicely, is the proximal ulnar dorsal angulation angle at the proximal aspect of the ulna, which is called the PUDA angle. And this is important to reestablish, especially when we're treating proximal ulna fractures, because if not adequately reestablished, you tend to lose elbow motion. And remember, in the coronal plane, as is shown in the bottom image, uh, tends to have a varus deformity of the proximal ulna. And, and this is in, the, in this coronal and sagittal plane, it's important to note the ulna's alignment and the anatomy as we're treating these fractures. As the first part of the component of the forearm joint is the disorinary joint, it's stabilized by the uh, dorsal and volar radial ulnar ligaments in the TFCC complex. And when we see injuries to the disorinary joint and associated radial shaft fractures, this is known as a Galeazzi type fracture, and we'll mention this further in the talk. The anatomy of the proximal radial joint uh, is important to note. The anterior ligament secures the radial head to the ulna. And when you have injury to the rare capitular joint, it's associated with uh, what we call montagia type fractures. The interosseous membranes comprise of five ligaments. The central band is a key portion, is a key portion to the interosseous membrane to be reconstructed. It's composed of the accessory band, the distal oblique bundle, the proximal oblique cord, the dorsal oblique, and the central band. The central band tends to be the one that we reconstruct in a chronic setting of interosseous membrane insufficiency. Important to know when the interosseous membrane is compromised or you have the extremes of the disorinary joint or proximal joint involved, you can have a form of transverse form instability. 
This leads to impeachment between the radius and the owner, either proximally or distally. And usually this is a result of excision of the owner head distally or excision of the radar head proximally. A different form of instability that's noted is the longitudinal form of instability. When the radius migrates proximally impacting the capitellum, it is the result of the radio head excision after fracture with disruption of the interosseous membrane in the TFCC complex. One of the things to note, uh, the distal interosseous membrane, the component of the distal oblique bundle in the in our hand and upper extremity literature, uh, this study by Marimoto and their group were able to show that the thickness of the distal membrane varies widely among specimens. It varied between 0.5 to 2.6 millimeters. And this distal oblique bundle, which is shown here in the arrow, is thick within the distal interosseous membrane and it exists only in about 40% of their specimens. So not everybody has the distal oblique bundle of that distal interosseous membrane, but when there and when present serves as a secondary stabilizer, especially for those injuries that involve the radial shaft and the TFCC complex, it becomes a secondary stabilizer. And it also has significance and those patients that do have it when we consider doing ornery shortening procedures, either proximally or distally to the distal oblique bundle. For these, as we now know the pertinent anatomy, how do we evaluate and how do we document their presentation? Usually you need to obtain imaging that not only involves the form, but also the neighboring joints, meaning the wrist and the elbow joint, they need to be included. You need to assess the radio capitary joint as shown here. You may have electron arm fractures, or you need to assess the distal joint where you may have a dislocation or further fracture to the ulnar head. Imaging does correlate quite nicely with these fracture patterns, and you need to look at the radio bow, which was determines your pronation subination, and this must be surgically restored when compromised. Methods to assess the radio bow include comparison to contralateral imaging, direct anatomic reduction, simple fractures, also looking at the bicipital tuberosity, which is usually a line 100 degrees to the radio styloid. Important to note that the ona has an opposite apex medial bow of the ona, specifically on the lateral view. When they present acutely, specifically for open fractures, antibiotics is of paramount importance, especially in the initial presentation. And you have to provide and carry out careful attention to the neurovascular status of the patient, of the, specifically of the involved extremity. Your physical and radiographic exam not only includes the form, but also the wrist and elbow joints. You, when immobilizing and reducing these fractures, you want to make sure that you're mobilized above the elbow. And always consider that these are a high risk of, of compartment syndrome, especially in these high energy mechanisms. So you need to have this in the back of your mind. Again, document and look for associated injuries, not only in the form, but also looking at associated injuries in the wrist and the elbow. And again, concern of compartment syndrome, always have that on the back of your mind. And we know that prognosis in these fractures of the form, when we treat them, it depends on restoration of the radial bow. As we move to the treatment of the form fractures, now that we've addressed the evaluation for treatment, uh, it varies from surgical to non-surgical treatment. The ona it tends to be treated non-surgically when it's a form of what we know as a knife stick fracture, but the ona has to be stable, has to be displaced less than 33%, has to be angulated less than 10 degrees. And it's important to note that these fractures do take a long time to heal. And in the literature, it does report about a 13% non-union rate, specifically in the distal segment portion of the form when you have a single ona fracture. The radius, in order for us to treat it non-operatively, it has to meet certain requirements. It has to be stable, has to be non-displaced. The radio will has to be maintained, but you need to follow these patients closely, but most require surgical fixation. It has been shown that for isolated owner shaft fractures with greater than 10 degrees of angulation, 50 degrees of displacement, these can result in significant loss of form rotation when treated non-operatively. But most of these form injuries do require surgical uh, fixation or and most of these fractures are operative in adults, and these are both bone form fractures. Uh, you have, if you don't treat them surgically, loss of the radial bow, which interferes with rotation. And these single diaphyseal injuries, uh, you need to look at the neighboring joints of the PRJ or DRJ for any involvement as well. And again, as previously stated, the exceptions are the non-displaced single single bone injuries that in, with an intact PRJ and DRJ. But most are required operative fixations and, and the indication stated in the literature on stable form fractures when you have severe comminution between 30 and 50 degrees when you have open fractures 
And we'll talk a little bit about fixation techniques and we'll go through each of them, and, but the standard of care is plates and screws. Surgical approach, it depends on the bone that you're treating. For the radius, we discuss the Voller anterior Henry approach or the dorsal Thompson approach. For the ONA, we discuss the Boyd approach, which is a continuous approach to the ONA between the FCU and the ECU. And we'll talk a little bit about you know, fixation techniques and bone grafting techniques. Remember that for the surgical approach, we don't recommend a single incision because the risk of symptoms is fairly high with single incision approach to both the radius and the ONA in the forearm. From the surgical approaches, the anterior approach uh, is the anterior Henry approach. It's best for distal and middle third fractures. It's usually in the proximal interval plane is between the brachioradialis and the pronator teres, and distal is between the brachioradialis and the FCR tendon. The dorsal lateral approach of what is known as the Thompson approach. This is as best for proximal third fractures, and it's between the ECRB and the EDC plane. One of the things is we talk about the Boyd approach, the ONA approach is along the sequitans border of the ONA, and it's between the ECU and the FCU. As we know now the approach, and we do it separately for each specific bone, we'll talk about the fixation techniques. First, about intermandibular fixation it was first described by Schoen in 1913 using silver rods. This was then modified in the 50s and 60s with the introduction of the prevent sage radial nails. These were fluted and square nails. Then in AO, popularized their plate fixation technique in the 60s and 70s, and this kind of fell out of favor. The indications for IM nail and our practice now is only for pediatric fractures, uh, but there's a subsequent of patients that do have fracture patterns, such as mental fractures, pathologic fractures that would benefit from IM fixation. You do have to have specific requirements that you, you, know, you have to have at least five centimeters of intact bone proximally or distally, and you have to make sure that you have less than 10 degrees of angulation. And in some literature, they state about soft tissue problems to use IM nail, uh, especially for open grade 3 8 fractures. External fixation uh, is rarely used, but when we use it, it's more mainly as a staging treatment, not a definite treatment. And usually once a soft tissue envelope injury has been addressed, then we convert these to a definite fixation. And again, uh, it does, serve as a staging part of treatment, especially in our, in our trauma one center when we see these mangled extremities. Plate fixation is the treatment of choice. It affords you the ability to provide anatomic reduction, restoration of the length, rotational alignment, and the radial bow. Plate fixation update, it used to be described in those initial AO techniques that traditional short bulky plates. Now we've evolved to using balanced long plate double plating techniques. The plate selection uh, varies from 3.5 millimeter LC DC plate to also a 2.7 millimeter DC plate in smaller patients. What you do want to do is avoid tubular or flexible plates. Uh, you must provide a slight pre bend if you're providing compression to especially at the radius. And for those common intersegmental bone loss uh, involvement, you want to use these long contour plates with well balanced screws uh, with a good balanced screw spread preferred. Technique, uh, one of the things that we want to avoid is this short plate technique here. Uh, that's a no, no. Uh, we want to address these with 3.5 L millimeter LC DC plate or DCP plate. You want to have six cortices, both in the proximal and the distal fractured segments. You want to reduce the easier bone first, but also this is also very surgeon dependent. You want to use last screws when possible, and they can be of different caliber uh, than 2.5 millimeters. You can have 2.0 millimeter place uh, screws depending on the size of the bone. But you want to use short length screws at the end of the plates. You want to also use non-locking screws because uh, this decreases the uh, incidence of stress rises when we use locking plates at the end of plates. One thing uh, we need to discuss is to lock or not to lock the plate. Usually, uh, when you do locking screws, it becomes an internal external fixator. They're a little bit more expensive, so we don't tend to use them in good, healthy bone, but more likely in common units for parotid bone, we do use locking screws. One of the things is, is uh, new designs of our longer plates is a uh, calometric design, which mimics callus uh, formation. And this basically is a plate design that is to the, the the strength of the place is designed to decrease over its length uh, in order to avoid to address the stress shielding by unloading the stress to the bone, mimicking again cow's formation. 
Or if with plates, you can do it with or without bone grafting. Those that we do with bone grafting, we tend to use our tallest bone graft, but when we have defects greater than five centimeters, we tend to use vascularized grafting. And the more common the an open injury, the more bone loss, the risk of non-union goes much higher for these injuries. Thanks to having our surgical toolbox, we'll discuss of our toolbox for simple fractures and coming with fractures. For simple fractures, we'll have one of the things that we recommend is traction via forceps proximally and distally to restore your length. You want to use point of reduction clamps or oblique fractures. You want to modify your clamp that is not as bent, but it's more of a straight clamp for those transverse fractures. And most transverse fractures will inherently be stable once the length is restored. Lack screw simple fragments to simplify the fracture. And you want to, again, ensure correct restoration of the length and the radial bow. For those coming into fractures with significant bone loss, you want to contour a straight plate for the bowed bone, so that you may have to place it somewhat off axis. And the options of precontour anatomical plates is a very good option to have in this severely complex injuries. You want to clamp to reduce bone to the plate. And again, focus on your length, alignment, rotation, and reestablishment of your bow. What are the bad actors in these injuries? Uh, one, uh, we'll mention three of them, is the SX lopressi injury, the Montecha fracture, and the galaxy fractures. Bad actors tend to be seen when you have disruption of the TFCC complex, the annular ligament, or the unosseous membrane. Initial angulation greater than 15 degrees is associated with bad actors in these form injuries. When you have severely uh, commutative fractures as well as transfer fractures, they tend to be rotationally unsound or unstable. And proximal radial fractures uh, can be difficult to treat. And in the young adult pediatric population, they may also know to have plastic deformation. And that may be a bad actor waiting um, in a sense in how they behave and we have to be cognizant of them. The SS Opressi injury was described by Peter Gordon SS Opressi uh, from the Birmingham Accident Hospital in England. When he was seeing his military recruits uh, with these type of injuries that presented with radial head or neck fractured with disruption of the DRJ and the unosseous membrane. The treatment is to address the DRJ by stabilizing it, avoiding radial head excision, because if not, you'll have proximal migration of the radius and on a positive risk. You want to consider the unosseous membrane reconstruction in the acute setting, more, more likely with a uh, Tight rope in some acute setting, but mainly the chronic setting, we tend to reconstruct the central band and the results are not as predictable. The best outcomes are obtained when addressed early, when you detect the injury early and treat it. The Montea fracture usually is a fracture of the proximal ulna with dislocation of the proximal radius, but with the radial head. Important to note on the x rays that the radial head should line up with the capitellum in all views. One of the things is Beto classified these as anterior dislocation, which is the most common, but you may also have posterior dislocation, lateral dislocation, or an anterior dislocation with the fracture of the ulna and the radius. Dr. Jupiter and his group, they modified the Beto classification type two because these tend to be bad actors, and these are the type two posterior dislocation that involve fracture of the lecrona or the lecrona or the, or the coronoid process, and we need to be mindful of these. Galaxy fracture, as described by Ricardo Galeazzi in Milan in the 1930s, where he described a uh, mid distal radius fracture with uh, dislocation of distal radial joint. And one of the things is that you have to address the radial shaft fracture, and subsequently, this will help with stabilization of distal radial joint. But how do we know that this radial joint is injury? Well, there's some radiographic signs, such as on or styloid base with significant displacement winding of the disorientated joint, or it's a blux ulna on the lateral view. When you have radial shortening greater than five millimeters, uh, this can also uh, be a consideration of disorientated joint injury and clinical signs such as a piano key. But one of the things is when you see small periarticular fracture segments, usually these are associated with big ligament injuries such as in the Sagan fracture of the tibial plateau. Classification for this type of injury, uh, there's a subtype classification that was described by Ring and Reddy in, in 2001, where they looked at and defined those type one fractures that was an injury which was less than 7.5 centimeters from the articular surface. And these patients that had this radial shaft fracture within this uh, length, they had instability 55% of the time. Those that had a type two fracture greater than 7.5 centimeters away from the articular surface, they had less DRJ instability, ranging around 6%. Treatment for these is RF of the deficit radius fracture. The dislocation of the DRJ usually reduces if it's unstable. 
Uh, sometimes may require an open foil repair, which is the most common thing I do in my practice, but also you can do DRJ painting and supination and subset of these patients. With any of these four fractures that we treat, we can have complications uh, from the pattern of injury. And to list a few, and we'll discuss a few of these, are include infection, compartment syndrome, malunion, nonunion, infection, refracture after plate removal, and radioulnar synostosis. Infection is not uncommon, but more commonly associated with open injuries. And in order for us to treat these infections once present, we have to provide an aggressive treatment, remove the infected hardware, and reestablish a, a, a plateau or a soft tissue that has been quiescent of free of infection, meaning that the lab values have normalized, specifically the ESR, CRP, and the white blood cell count. They no interpretive findings of continued infections, and then revision oxytocin does work well. And again, using the 3.5 millimeter compression plating technique with a minimum of six cortices. In combination, we tend to use the index induced membrane technique, which is the masculinity technique, it tends to work for well in, in our form for fractures that have become infected. Bone loss uh, may occur in conjunction with high energy open fractures or ballistic injuries. Uh, this is when sometimes you may consider acute uh, bone grafting or PMA spacer uh, in doing the induced membrane technique and then coming back and bone grafting. In a subset of patients, you may require bone transport, which is potentially useful and, and, and does require patient compliance as well as surgeon experience. This is a case of an example we treat a high energy mechanism with bone loss, unstable pattern, was treated. We had a fairly good alignment. There was some bone loss. This unfortunately went on to develop an infected non-union, which was then treated with removal of the hardware, debridement, and removal of non-viable bone. We did the induced membrane technique, the masculine technique. And once the infection had resolved, at this point, we then did the reconstruction. And what we did, we considered vascularized bone grafting because our combined defect was greater than five centimeters. Uh, and we did the double barrel technique, which uses uh, the fibula as a double component, double barrel bone for the radius and the ona, with leaving the perineal pedicle intact. And this is our anastomosis shown here to the radial artery and the basilic vein. And subsequently, this is our plate fixation. We use a double plating technique uh, in order to obtain rigid fixation uh, in addition to our bony reconstruction. And this is showing that two years out, we have healing, good reasonable alignment, not perfect, but definitely much better than when we started and the infection had resolved. As we move to compartment syndrome, is increased risk with high energy mechanism, open fractures, low velocity gunshot wound, vascular injuries, and DICs, uh, coagulopathies, you can see them. We also see them in some COVID patients that present with this type of coagulopathy and have a foreign fracture. It does require high clinical suspicion and patients will present with pain out of proportion, pain with passive stretch, tense compartment paresthesias. And again, this is a clinical diagnosis. There's three compartments in the form, the dorsal, volar, and the mobile wad. You need to address these three and also a carpal tunnel release is recommended. Sometimes it, you need to consider compartment syndrome after you restore the length of the reduction. You need to be careful in the setting of regional blocks because this can mask and compartment syndrome. And, and consider early prophylactic fasciotomies when you're treating these by open reduction or fixation due to form releases within your same incisions at that time of surgery. Nonunion is not common. It varies between 2 and 10 percent. It can present either hypertrophic, oligotrophic, or atrophic. When we see it in, with atrophic nonunions, can be treated with plating as well as bone grafting, and you you know and you use vascularized bone grafting when the defect is greater than five centimeters. Malunion, when present, early correction uh, is recommended, as been shown by the Mayo Group uh, with Trusto, that they were able to show good results when the malunion was identified early and treated within the year. And again, it's a direct correlation between restoration of the radial bow and their functional outcome. One of the things to note and use this as a reference is this is a great article by the uh, orthopedic group at Duke where they were able to characterize and man and how to manage these form non-unions is for you know what frequently use lab work such as comp 
complex metabolic panel, parathyroid, vitamin D, all those things should be part of your workup. So I would urge you to look at this article for a good reference when you're treating these non-unions. One of the things, if you look at their algorithm, uh, when they had segmental defects greater than five centimeters, they recommend that free fibular grafting. When it was less revision OIF with compression plating, can cells bone graft work well. Neurovascular injuries are uncommon with these forearm fractures, usually more likely associated with Montagia fracture when we see posterior and osseous nerve injury, or through a proximal volar or Henry approach when it can be injured through the approach, but also can be seen with open fractures, especially high energy mechanisms type 3 that involve the proximal radius. We tend to observe these if initially it's a more of a narrow practice stretch injury. But if there's a concern of a, a penetrating type of injury or, or not recovered within three months, uh, we don't hesitate to explore these injuries. Synostosis is uncommon, but we see it in between three and nine percent, and mainly with this is associated with a single incision approach. When present and removed, we tend to remove them early between four and six months. We do use prophylactic radiation therapy. Uh, we also combine indocine and cerebrex uh, in the post-op period. A little bit about hardware removal uh, is not on, it's not noted without any complications. You may have a refracture rate in the literature shows between four and 20%. And important to tell your patients that pain may persist. Specifically with uh, those plates that are removed too early, those plates that were fairly large, like a 4.5 millimeter plate, those fractures that were severely comminuted that had long plates that had persistent radiographic lucency, those may refracture after removal. So we don't recommend removing plates before 15 months. And you, you know, and if we do remove the plates, around that after that 15 month period, uh, we highly recommend a forearm functional brace for the first six weeks and protect the patient from contact activities, uh, contact spores uh, for the first three months after plate removal. In summary, uh, we've discussed that for forearm fractures, consider it uh, the form as a unit of bone composed of the radius and ulna, but also of the disorientary joint, the proximal rear joint and the interosseous membrane. You want to restore your fore anatomy with fixation techniques. You want to restore your length, your alignment, your rotation, and the incorrect bow. You want to provide stable, congruent elbow wrist joints once you fix the forearm fractures. You want to address the fractures that involve the sigma notch of the radial head. You want to provide robust fixation to allow early motion. You want to avoid thin tubular plates. And you want to use intelligence fixation based on the fracture pattern. For those simple patterns, you want to obtain anatomic reduction and compression. For those coming with patterns, you want to restore the length, the alignment, the rotation, and the bow with bridge plating. Thank you.